Thank you so much, Ursula von der Leyen, dear colleagues, friends, stewards of the planet. What I will do now in the next uh, 20 minutes is to provide you the scientific story in support of Ursula von der Leyen and all our efforts of transforming the world within the safe operating space of the planet and proving the point that nature is the path to prosperity and equity and that we have ample science to support this. Now, we are forced today for the first time in the scientific journey on Earth to pose the following question. Are we at risk of destabilizing the entire Earth system? This is the dramatic point we've reached. We are risking the stability, the resilience, and the very life support of the entire planet. We cannot exclude pushing the entire planet out of the stability that has enabled civilizations to develop on planet Earth. And the evidence is ample. And this, I would argue, is the most important piece of evidence we have today. We are here at 1.2 degrees Celsius of global temperature rise. This is the warmest temperature on Earth over the past 100,000 years. I'm citing the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We're following a pathway taking us to 2.7 degrees Celsius within the range of your grandchildren. This is a place we haven't been in for the past three million years. I can tell you, despite all scientific uncertainty, this is, with no hesitation, a path to disaster. There's no evidence whatsoever that we can cater in a responsible way for humanity in a 2.7 degrees Celsius world. We have followed a remarkable 10,000-year period within a very narrow corridor of life. This is the Holocene. This is when we left the last ice age. We were hunters and gatherers. We were a few million people. We domesticate animals and plants, go through the Neolithic Revolution, and off we go in the civilizational journey that we all know so well. That is the life corridor we, do, we depend on. It's a 14 degrees Celsius world, plus minus 0.5. 0.5. All the climate denialism that loves to talk about the medieval warm period and when the Vikings harvested grapes on Greenland. Sure, there was a lot of regional natural variability within 0.5. 0.5. We're now at 1.2, kicking ourselves out of the quarter of life. But it's even more dramatic than that. Because if you go back three million years, you'll see that the oscillations between long ice ages of 100,000 years and warm interglacials never exceeded two degrees Celsius of warming, the warmest temperature on Earth over the past entire quaternary, and deep ice age minus five. I call this the grand corridor of life. Why? Well, because we have been modern homo sapiens during just two ice ages and two interglacials. So we have never been outside of the corridor of life. And now we are shooting ourselves away from it. And the question is, why is this happening? Well, of course, fossil fuel burning is number one, but I can tell you, science is clear today, that the ultimate determinant, what regulates the stability of the planet, its ability to stay in a desired equilibrium state, is nature. It is the resilience of the planet. It is the buffering capacity of all the richness in nature which determines the final state of the planet. And we have the evidence. Here's the most important graph of them all. You know this one, I'm sure. This is the annual update of the Global Carbon Project. It's the global carbon cycle, the most important biogeochemical cycle on planet Earth from 1850 until today. We burn fossil fuels in red. We cut down and destroy ecosystems in orange. This is the hockey stick of emitting carbon dioxide. It's what has caused the climate crisis. It's 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year emitted. The question is, is it the whole area under that curve that has caused the crisis so far? The answer is no because we have this tremendous uptake of carbon in the ocean and carbon on land, intact nature on land, it's only the blue residual which remains in the atmosphere causing the 1.2 degrees Celsius warming so far that it triggers already today a 300 billion US dollar invoice to the economy because of droughts, floods, heat waves, disease patterns and fires. But look at the graph. Even a kid would say, isn't that right? quite remarkable? The more we punch the planet, the more she's helping us. And this is exactly right. Over 150 years, a healthy planet has responded in biogeochemical stress response through its resilience to buffer our um, stress to the system, our abuse to the system. This number here is every year, on average, 50%. 25% on land, 25% in the ocean. And on land, it's only intact nature. 
Agriculture is a net source of emissions. It's actually the single largest net source. So if we do not be stewards of nature, we will have a destabilization of the planet. And unfortunately, which you know so well, we have so much scientific evidence today that we're starting to see cracks in this resilience of nature on land, in this case, forest systems that are tipping over. Did you know that the latest science on the Brazilian part of the Amazon rainforest shows that the richest ecosystem on land on planet Earth, the Amazon basin, has already tipped over from carbon sink to net carbon source. But we see signs in the temperate forests in Germany, in Scandinavia, in Canada. We see it in the boreal forests up in the Arctic. We're seeing cracks in this system. We also know that this is related to biodiversity. The hockey stick of loss of species undermines the resilience of ecosystems and makes them more prone to tipping. As Ursula von der Leyen pointed out, as we've been talking about here yesterday and today, we are at this sixth mass extinction of species. 70% of the population of vertebrates are gone since 1970. The weight of livestock plus humans now outpass the weight of wild mammals. I mean, this is drama at a planetary scale. The Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, led by Sandra Diaz, has put all the numbers on this. I, I find it just shocking that 82% of volumes of mammals are gone on planet Earth. This is a point where we need to wake up and fundamentally veer off this disaster path, even if it's you know, focused only on jobs, economy, and security, because this is about jobs, economy, and security. And the implications on the climate side are starting to become really serious. And here is something that we are now exploring currently because we don't even have the answer to it. Here you have the classic observations from five different sources of the temperature rise caused by our fossil fuel burning and degradation of nature. We followed a path of 0.18 degrees Celsius of warming per decade. You know, the rule of thumb is 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade is the linear relationship between our fossil fuel burning and global warming. Unfortunately, since 2014, we see something happening. The rate has increased. It has jumped up to 0.26 degrees Celsius per decade. And we cannot explain it, because we are actually bending the curve of emissions. We haven't turned yet, but we're not increasing at the same pace as before. What is happening? Is it the resilience of the Earth system which is losing capacity? Is the climate sensitivity shifting because nature is losing its health? Well, there are warning signs. You've seen them, of course, in 2023 with this remarkable, I've never among colleagues heard the kind of language that has been used of the shocking observations of sea surface temperatures going completely off the charts. Off the charts. This is, of course, coupled to the El Nino we saw, but it's a human amplified El Nino at a level we've never seen before. So that's why we see more and more science like this showing, I mean, this is very detailed science, but showing that when you combine biodiversity loss and land use change with climate change, it goes red across the entire planet. Red meaning losing species, losing ecosystems, going into a vicious cycle of self-amplified loss of resilience. This is why ecologists, for example, here led by Kirsten Tonicke, a colleague at the Potsdam Institute, on the latest update on the 10 most important insights in biodiversity science, has as number one the need to integrate climate and biodiversity. The topics we have here is right at the center. This is an absolute survival strategy for humanity today. And the question is, of course, is this something that we're just a few scientists raising? Well, no. Actually, if you go into the summary of the sixth assessment of the IPCC's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, look at the high-level summary. We are causing global warming. It's threatening human health. It's unequivocal we are actually at risk of destabilizing the planet. This is IPCC statement. But it also concludes that we need to maintain biodiversity to keep the buffering capacity in the climate system intact. We actually need to, up to 50% of nature needs to be protected. And as you know, of course, we are already having destroyed 50%. We've come to the end of the road of expanding agriculture. We've come to the end of the road of losing nature. And this is something that increasingly is researched, also in terms of climate impacts. We published just two years back the first quantitative assessment showing that something in the order of 0.4 degrees Celsius already today has been protected by nature on land. So if it, if it didn't have nature, 
we would have passed the Paris range already today. Already today. But if we don't turn back on nature, just biodiversity loss can take us on its own over two degrees Celsius. So nature is fundamentally a prerequisite to deliver on the Paris Agreement. To make that clear, even if we phase out coal, oil, and gas, we do everything right, we will still fail unless we do right on nature. So this is what we now have to start recognizing seriously. That fundamentally, it boils down to the resilience of the whole system. The resilience of the system is being eroded right now, and it is all about nature. That makes systems more brittle, and we risk crossing tipping points. If you cross a tipping point, a system goes from a healthy state to an unhealthy state, from a cooling state to a self-warming state, and this gives a feedback which takes us into a self-propelling journey that may potentially become unmanageable. This is why the planetary boundary science spends so much time in mapping tipping points. We have mapped 16 climate tipping points. Six of them are up in the Arctic. You've read a lot about them in the Gulf Stream and the AMOC. They're all connected via the ocean to the big, big Amazon basin, but also all the way down to Antarctica. We have more and more science showing that five of these are at risk of tipping already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Those are the top five you see on this list. This is the most authoritative scientific assessment done so far that you see on the screen. The red embers is the uncertainty range in science. The deeper the red, the higher the risk of tipping. It's a temperature range on the x-axis. The top five with the little dots there is the likely temperature at which they will tip. Which ones are they? The Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, all tropical coral reef systems on planet Earth, all of them. Livelihoods for over 200 million people. Abrupt thawing of permafrost in the boreal Arctic zone, a self-amplifier, and losing the Labrador Sea current southwest of Greenland, which is one of the regulators of regional climate in the Northern Hemisphere. Isn't this a warning signal that we just have to hold 1.5 for whatever we can, and we're now rapidly moving towards an overshoot, and we know that the only way to come back from overshoot is to phase out fossil fuels and keep the buffering capacity nature intact on planet Earth. But dear friends, it is actually potentially worse than I showed in that previous slide. <laughs> Sorry to say. Because that was a climate analysis. The previous slide was only the temperatures based on the climate modeling work we do, for example, at the Potsdam Institute and many other climate institutions. Here is the assessment from Brazilian ecologists who tell us, you're wrong. The Amazon basin, one of these big tipping element systems that we estimate may tip somewhere between three and five degrees Celsius of warming, so far out in a very, very, very dangerous zone. They say you're wrong. It may tip much earlier because we, if you lose more than 20 to 25 percent of forest cover and biodiversity, the system becomes so brittle that it may tip at already 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius warming. And we have more and more science supporting this. Why does this happen? It's because the richness of the biodiversity keeps the moisture system and the self-generation of rainfall. A rainforest is called a rainforest because it generates 40 to 50 percent of its own rainfall. If you ask Professor Carlos Nobres, the leading scientist on the Amazon, he'll tell you we're very close to a tipping point because we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming and 17 percent of deforestation and biodiversity loss in the Amazon. So when you combine nature and climate, not only is it a pathway to solution, it's also a pathway to a richer risk assessment. And this has also been published quite significantly today. This is Hans Otto Pertner's work, um, supporting through the IPBS and the IPCC work. All in all, to close, we, we really have to recognize, we have to become stewards of the planet. We have to reconnect to nature. We truly have to make this a part of the pathway to prosperity and equity which is why science has advanced the planetary boundary framework, identifying the nine biogeophysical systems that regulates the health of the planet. We have quantified all the nine. We can now provide a safe operating space. These can become safe uh, science-based targets. Six of the nine boundaries are outside of the safe space. This is what confirms if everything that we're observing. Nature is biodiversity integrity, is in the deep red, both in terms of genetic diversity loss, but also ecosystem functions. Is there anything positive in this assessment? Well, yes, of course. We can manage what we measure, and it can be translated into policies and operationalization. 
And we see things increasingly happening, at least on the desk level. This is the nature positive agenda coming out of the Montreal Kunming Global Biodiversity Framework, which was informed by the planetary boundary science, which concluded that we now need to halt the loss of biodiversity. The 30 by 30, 30% 30 reductions by 2030, supported by the European Union's work, is, is a path towards that safe landing for humanity. I would argue that what came out of the Global Biodiversity Framework was informed by our Earth system science at a human development context. We, for the first time, have these numbers that we can account against. Putting nature on the accounting sheet needs that we have quantitative targets over time, 2030, 2040, 2050, just like the Green Deal for nature and for climate. And we can do that now scientifically. I just want to paradigm shift-wise also say that economists are really coming on board. This is the Sir Parthadas Gupta Economics of Biodiversity Review that I'm sure you all remember in the run-up to the Glasgow COP26, where finally we're starting to see a shift in economic research, recognizing that the economy, of course we need economic development, needs to occur within a thriving biosphere, meaning within scientifically defined safe operating space of a stable and resilient Earth system. I therefore close with this slide, which is, you know, I'm a Swede. I am the biggest admirer of um, uh, Gru Harlem Brundtland's work on defining sustainable development from the 1992 Agenda 21 setting Brundtland Commission. But we have to redefine sustainable development today. Today, the planet is on the line. Today, nature are, is a global commons. Irrespective of if we are in Munich, we depend on stable green and ice sheet, stable Amazon, stable marine systems. They're all global commons. The definition of sustainable development, in my view, is prosperity and equity within a stable and resilient planet. That's what has to guide us at any scale, for any innovation, for any economic endeavor. And we can do it because we're starting to truly see policies that can operate across scales in that direction. So I'm actually quite enthusiastic, despite the fact that we're still on that bumpy road in a transition. But we all know that if we are through that gauntlet, the light in the tunnel is clear. We will come out all as winners. Thank you very much. Thank you.